Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Natalie Steinauer, and uh, I'm the coordinator for the Be Informed Partnership. Um, um, so um, we're going to talk today about uh, about pollen, and um, uh, I'm located at University of Maryland and College Park, uh, and I'm really responsible for all of the um, scientific design of studies that we conduct and, and uh, analyzing a lot of our data. And uh, with me co-hosting this webinar is Dan Wines. Dan Wines, do you, Dan, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, <clears throat> I'm Dan Wines. I'm based in uh, Lansing, Michigan, Michigan State University. I'm one of the field specialists. We'll kind of, um, I guess, uh, describe the overview here as we, we get into a, some brief intro slides on BIP. So maybe we can move into that now and I'll explain a little more what I do relevant to that. So um, Be Informed is a, a national organization. Um, primary goal is to improve colony health uh, for all beekeepers, to provide support to beekeepers, um, kind of acting as a, as a bridge, a, a conduit between science and industry and the beekeeping community. Um, and, and Be Informed is the largest repository of colony health data in the country. You can see um, there's about 10 um, you know, universities listed here. These are all collaborators that either host a tech team or different aspects, different programs of being formed, the diagnostic lab and things like that. So quite a, quite a good collaborative organization all aimed at improving bee health and helping beekeepers. <clears throat> as far as what we do, um, there's quite a few different programs and kind of levels. Um, one of the primary things Be Informed does is the National Loss and Management Survey. Um, it's conducted every spring, um, asks a lot of questions of beekeepers of all scales, sizes, uh, experience levels on uh, management practices and colony losses in both uh, summer and winter months. And actually this you um, may have seen just recently this past um, year's results have been released in the last few days and they've come across my news feed as well. Um, so look for those, those results are out. Um, another platform Be Informed has is the tech transfer teams. Um, this is, uh, as I say, this is what I do based in Michigan. Um, and we work primarily with the large commercial beekeepers in the country. I was managing anywhere from, you know, a few hundred to tens of thousands of colonies. Um, we get out in the field with them, um, looking at colony health and, and helping them uh, evaluate and improve management practices. Another platform is the Sentinel Apiary Program, um, and that is kind of a citizen science program where beekeepers collect data and sample their own colonies, but it provides access um, to the diagnostic lab for things like Varroa and Nosema. Um, and it's also, it's been a really good addition to be informed because it provides this longitudinal data. If, if you enroll in the Sentinel Apiary program, you sample the same colonies every month for roughly six months or the, the length of kind of your active prime beekeeping season. Um, also involved in a lot of field trials, whether that's, um, you know, new, new hive products, miticides, feed additives, things like that. We get approached as a kind of a third party to test those things in a um, real world beekeeping setting. Also um, some IT uh, platforms, things like mic check and, and um, other things like that, that are again, trying to get both allow um, the public to contribute data, but also learn from that data. And then, um, responding to emergency situations, kind of unexplained bee kills, acute incidents, things like that. The lab does kind of expedite some uh, diagnostic services in those sort of cases. So a lot of different levels and they say trying to be of service to the, the beekeeping community and industry. So we have a quick poll question here, just um, gauging what type of beekeeper um, you are as an audience member. And there's our poll. We'll give you about 30 seconds, so about 15 seconds more here. Okay, I'm gonna close the poll and I'm gonna share the results and I'm just gonna read them for the sake of our recording. 
So backyard beekeepers, it looks like we have 71% at 58. Sideline is 11% at nine. We don't have any commercial answering the poll and not currently beekeeping 15 participants at 18%. Okay, thank you. Um, so just as I mentioned, I'm uh, one of the tech transfer team uh, field specialists. There are currently six of us uh, based at five different universities around the country. Here you can kind of see where we're, where we're hosted. I'm at Michigan State. Um, more of the Spivak's lab in Minnesota. Um, Ramesh Sagili's lab at o Oregon State University. Uh, Alina Lastro Nino out of Davis and Juliana Rangel out of uh, a and So we do kind of try to cover um, you know, the country as far as where we're based. Uh, we do travel a fair amount. Um, we say these are kind of our regional home locations, but now with these dots that have just emerged and kind of the, all the arrows kind of give a um, sense of where we go. I myself go, you know, kind of think of it as kind of the Great Lakes region. I cover Wisconsin, New York, um, Indiana, Ohio, uh, but also the, these large beekeepers we work with are for the most part migratory. So like, for example, myself, I, I go to Georgia and Florida, South Carolina when they're in their southern wintering locations. And as you see, most um, most arrows point towards California because most of the large commercial beekeepers in this country spend at least a portion of their year there pollinating almonds. So we do cover a lot of ground, um, a lot of travel involved, but it's, that's the nature of um, the beekeepers we work with. So we, we go where the bees go. And then our diagnostic lab, it all is, we're out in the field. Um, we do take a lot of samples. It all kind of flows through the University of Maryland, um, Dennis Van Engelsdorf lab. They do our, a uh, lot of our sample processing there. So that's kind of headquarters and um, everything kind of flows back through them. So as you can see, when we put up this, a um, lot of universities involved, it's a very collaborative nature. Um, Collectively, we're you know 100 and 110 commercial operations managing about half a million colonies. That's you know roughly one in six colonies in the United States. Um, as you see by all these arrows, uh, we, we do cover a lot of ground, a lot of miles. You know, this past year with more than 100,000 between the six of us. Um, so that that's the nature. The bees move and we move. Um, as far as what we do as as tech transfer team and, and field specialists. Um, we do colony health inspection. Um, we do some, you know, diagnostic testing and, and consulting, trying to help um, beekeepers understand um, whether they're kind of evaluate their management practices and and um, offer some suggestions for improving those. We do monitor um, diseases in their colonies. That's part of it. As we inspect, we're looking for any visual signs of diseases, whether it's you know bacterial or fungal, um, those sort of things. We did do a webinar that's um, recordings available about a month ago on uh, some of the diseases, if you're interested in that. I'm sure we can get the link to that in the chat. Um, what you see here in this photo with the kind of steamy smoke, that's hygienic testing. That's actually liquid nitrogen. We do a, a freeze kill assay um, on the brood and it's helping uh, queen breeders select their breeding stock for this hygienic trait, um, which helps bees deal with um, certainly American fowl brood and chalk brood. It can also be helpful for uh, dealing with varroa mites. So it's, it's kind of this trying to breed a better bee. So we help breeders select from their stock. As I mentioned before, these kind of emergency visits um, and responding to acute incidents. And then uh, we do some research trials as well, and this is um, a, you know, a small-scale trial that we're going to run through today. We're going to talk about that, that we did in investigating um, pollen and what we can learn from pollen as a uh, kind of a diagnostic. So um, um, I'm going to start over with some uh, biological backgrounds, and then uh, Dan will take over for uh, the practicalities of how we collect the pollens and, and how you can try to uh, collect pollens in your own apiary, such as like tips and tricks that, you know, lessons that we learned that uh, um, uh, we'd like to share. Um, and then we'll show you the results of this uh, pilot study that, that we conducted. So all right, but going back to basics, the idea is that what do honeybees need in terms of food? And of course, uh, we all know um, uh, bees 
eat nectar and pollen. Nectars and pollen are, are collected by foragers and brought back to the colony. Um, um, so, so that's that's you know can can go as uh, can go more basic than that. So, um, so I want to go a little more into um, 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 the different families of nutrients that that compose honeybee diets. So for that. Uh, let's go to the definition, and the definition of, of nutrition is the provision to the organism and, and really all of the cells in the body of the organism of all the materials that are necessary to, to support life. And usually nutrients are divided between macronutrients and micronutrients. So macronutrients are those that the body needs in really large amounts, and micronutrients are those that the body needs in, in smaller amounts. So Micronutrients um, gather uh, carbohydrates, proteins, and, and lipids, right? So the carbohydrates are all the organic, the organic compounds that include sugars, starches, cellulose, and honeybees really, they can utilize monosaccharides and disaccharides, so all of the small sugars. Um, proteins, those are uh, basically long chains of amino acids. And then uh, lipids, they are the saturated fats, monosaturated fats, protein saturated fats, and all the sterols. So that's what we um, gather into, into lipids. And then the micronutrients that, uh, as we said, the, the body needs in smaller amounts, those are the vitamins and the minerals. And some of them are really needed in only trace only. Um, but so when we look at this list, right, uh, water, carbohydrates, protein, lipids, vitamin and minerals, uh, at this point it really looks like our own food pyramid, right? And, and so it was really funny because I looked for, in Google for a picture to represent food pyramids. And uh, you know, we all learned about this uh, in our years. Uh, but they have changed over time quite drastically. I actually I couldn't find two food pyramids that were the same on Google. They were all like they had all some type of categories that were switched back and forth. So just as the food pyramids uh, have evolved in human nutrition science, and our, our understanding of honeybee diet ha is evolving as well. So um, so generally, honeybee health, honeybee nutrition is an understudied field. So there are a lot of unknowns. So Please bear with me because I'm going to say we don't know a lot. Uh, but in short, uh, we know that all those nutrients are important. And, and really what you want is you want them in the right quantities, right? Just like for us, you don't want too much of one item is not good. Honeybees also need a balanced diet. So where do they get those nutrients from? So as I said, it's probably, it's, uh, uh, it's mostly nectar and, and pollen, right? That's the two sources of food of the bees. So nectar is, is really primarily just water with sugar. Um, and there's, so they're secreted by the nectar glands of the flower, the, the bees collect them. And, and, and so that's gonna be their, their, their primary source of, of carbohydrates. Um, sugar concentration in, in nectar can range from zero to 72%, so wide range. Although usually the average is, is something little uh, below 20%. So now weather can influence the concentration of the nectar, right? Rain can dilute the nectar, even to the point where it will lose attractiveness to the foragers. And then a, a very uh, hard dirt can actually make the nectar very viscous and so viscous that the bees can't even collect it. So um, there are some influence of the weather there. So bees will also collect water directly, and when they do, uh, when bees have a choice, they usually prefer water with some salt in it, so that's one source of, of minerals. Um, and then we also know that some uh, proteins have been found in nectar, but very small amounts as well. Pollen is really the main source, if not the only source of protein in most cases. Um, and pollen is also, will also provide all the lipids and the micronutrients that the bee needs. Now, beekeepers can supplement those bees, their bees with syrup and protein supplements, uh, but the, the composition of those uh, supplemental feeds is usually not on par with the real, with the real thing, uh, and definitely not when it concerns micronutrients. Um, so and unfortunately, because we know relatively little about the physiological needs of bees in all of those micronutrients, it's sometimes hard to identify and to quantify what is missing from supplements. Uh, but there are some studies available that show that variously, uh, various commercially available protein patties are lacking in some key nutrients. So um, it is an area under more study and, and, and you know, different brands are trying to make uh, supplements that are more in line with the needs of the bees. So it is an, an, an area under uh, constant um, progress. So overall the bees need their nutrients, right? So either from the environment or from the beekeeper. Um, so if the environment is lacking, supplementation is really all we have in a pinch. 
You can try to find a better location. You can try to improve your environment for the future in the long term. But in the short term, really feeding is the only um, uh, short term solution that we have. Um, I'm talking about, for example, Maryland. Um, pollen is usually plentiful, but we do have a, a rather large summer dirt in the, in the summer for nectar. So it's important to know what the resources are in your local area so that you know when you have to intervene, knowing that intervention by supplementation um, is not as good as the real, um, uh, the real stuff, but um, the pollen and nectar. But um, as I said, sometimes that's, that's all you have. So, um, I want to go a little more details as, as to why they need all of those nutrients and how they use them and what for. So the shorthand, if you remember anything, is that carbohydrates are the fuel of adult bees and proteins are the building blocks so that larvae can grow. Um, so carbohydrates, they're really the energy source. They're the main calories that provide bees with energy. And so that's why it's mostly important for adult bees because flying is a very energy intensive activity. Um, so so all, these are all the list of, uh, of the sugars that bees can digest and utilize, but mostly all of those uh, are small sugars, mono and disaccharides, and all the carbohydrates will first be converted to glucose, um, which then at the cellular level, so inside all of the cells, that enters um, what we call the Krebs cycle, and that's what produces ATP. Now you might remember ATP from some chemistry classes, this is a biochemistry class, this is really the, um, the molecular fuel of all the cells in our body, right? That's, um, that, that is the energy that uh, all the cells in the body needs, all the organs, all the muscles, they need ATP to function. So aside from being used as an energy source, glucose can also be converted then to body fat and stored. Um, um, but um, as a, uh, there is a study that estimated that um, a single worker bee needs 11 milligram of dry sugar each day. So when we do the math, um, a colony of about 50,000 bees will go to over a liter of one-to-one um, -one sugar syrup in one day. And, um, and sugar syrup is usually more concentrated than, than nectar. As we said, it's variable, but if I take the, the hypothesis that nectar is about 25%, which is a little on the um, high side, um, that means that a, a colony will go, um, will need more than two liters of nectar every day. And, um, and that's about, I, di I did the math, I had to do the math because I, I don't use non-metric system that much, but that's about half a gallon of nectar. All right, so we are here to focus on pollen, right? So um, I just wanted to touch base on carbohydrates real fast, but Pollen is really what we're interested about. So this is, um, this is all the components that are found in pollen. And as I said already, pollen is really all that is needed for brood rearing. So pollen is uh, the main and only source of protein for bees. Um, so that means that bees get amino acids from it. And out of the 20 amino acids that exist, 10 are considered essential to bees. That means that bees cannot synthesize those 10 amino acids on their own they 100% rely on their food to procure them. Um, so amino acids, they are, sorry, they are the essential building blocks of cells. Um, that means that you know, they're essential to create more cells. So that's growth and development in short term, right? And in particular, um, vitellogenin, um, it's, a, it's a protein that is usually used as an indicator uh, in most studies. Um, it's used in a lot of studies because they found a direct, in, uh, direct association between vitellogenin and bee lifespan. So vitellogenin is a, is a protein um, that's, that's stored in the fat bodies, in the abdomen, and in the head of the bees. Um, it's highest in nurse bees, and then it tends to decrease as the bee age. And as I said, a lot of studies that want to look at the protein status of bees, they look at vitellogenin as the indicator of that. So among lipids, uh, sterols have been found to be particularly important to young bees. And the major source of sterol for honeybees is this molecule, 24-methylene cholesterol. And bees cannot, again, cannot synthesize this directly, never. So that means that, again, uh, um, they rely on pollen to get that sterol. And it's, thankfully, it's common in pollen. Um, so they, they can find it relatively easily in, in the pollen. So the sterols are 
a very important component of the cell membranes. So this time it's the, you know, again, another type of brick in, in uh, a building brick in, in the cell, in this case, the cell membranes itself. And, and it's also an important precursor of some uh, hormones and in, in particular, the malting hormones. Um, use sterols to be to be built, which means that uh, it is really needed um, at every time that a bee is going to molt. So it is essential for the larval development into adults. That means that um, if nurse bees do not feed sterols to larvae as soon as they hatch, they will typically die in the first or second instar, uh, basically as soon as they exhausted the reserve of sterol that they received in their egg from their mother. Concerning vitamins, uh, there's a lot of unknown, but um, basically all of the, the ones that I listed here on this slide are thought to be essential for nurse bees to be able to rear brood. So again, we know it's impacting brood rearing. Um, I don't know that we have a lot more details as to, as to the mechanism. And minerals, again, <laughs> they're very poorly understood. But generally, we know that insects require a high amount of potassium, phosphate, and magnesium. So presumably, honeybees do too. Um, we also know that excessive levels of like sodium, sodium chloride, calcium, and others can sometimes be shown to be toxic to bees. So, as I said, um, nutrition is an understudied area that definitely deserves more attention. But so you can see how our pollen is really um, important for brood rearing in multiple aspects of the nutrients uh, contained in pollen. And so, um, in terms of quantity, actually, pollen collection range between 10 and 26 kilograms per colony per year. So that's that's uh, how, how much um, a typical colony will go through pollen. And um, some studies have, have linked pollen to indicator of health, both at the individual bee level and at the colony level. So I'm citing here a couple of studies that showed how, you know, we talked about the physiology uh, on the previous slides and how this physiology translates to observable effects at the bee level and at the colony level. So the first study uh, showed that when honeybees were provided with insufficient pollen or pollen of low nutritional value, the brood rearing decreased and, and also the worker lived shorter lives. And so this is particularly important when the colony is rearing its winter bees because those winter bees need to survive longest, right? They need to survive all the winter so that they can pick up in the spring and launch the colony again in the next year. So those definitely need <laughs> the full lifespan possible. So the, their, their feeding is really particularly important. And then the next one uh, was done in cage experiments. And um, they saw that uh, nutritionally deprived bees were more susceptible to virus than bees that were well fed. So there is an observable link between nutrition and Im immunity. And then finally, I wanted to show a study at the colony level because it's important to see how, how the effects um, um, can be seen at all level of the biological scale, right? So at the colony level, some studies have found evidence that the colony is close to, to very high quality landscape. And in that case, it was actually CRP lands. Um, those colonies performed better just in general. So now we have summarized where those nutrients are found, how they are used, and how it directly impacts um, both bee health and, and colony health. Um, so yeah, pollen is awesome. Um, but unfortunately, pollen, all pollen is not equal. Um, most pollen content between 7 and 40% of protein, like we've said before, uh, with an average of 20, which is convenient because 20 is the, um, actual, the, it's the level needed for optimal brood rearing by a colony, as, as has been found out. So 20 is really the mark that then we need to do to 20% of protein content in pollen is really what a colony needs to be able to do uh, brood rearing. But as, we, as, we, as you can see, not all pollen reach that 20% um, mark, right? Um, so that means that the same quantity of pollen does not mean the same quantity of protein. And so we know that pollen quantity is important. That means we know how much we need to know how much protein there is in that pollen as well. That's both aspects are very important. Um, also, not two pollens have the same composition with regards to amino acids and micronutrients. Um, so not all the pollens contain all the amino acids and micronutrients that are needed by bees. And also their ratio might be off. 
So if I can do a small parallel with, with humans, right, though burgers are full of protein, you would not do well if you eat only burgers. So same for bees and pollen. Um, in order to get all the amino acids they need, um, bees usually need to find more than one plant source, right? So that's usually where we say diversity of food is important to, be, to ensure that all the micronutrients get, get filled in. So in summary, ideally bees want a lot of pollen, from good quality and lots of different sources, which means that when we look at pollen available to bees to try to understand what is the availability of, of pollen and nutrient in the landscape, we need to look at pollen quantity, pollen quality, and pollen diversity. So, so it's important to look at all three aspects when we do a study. So I'm gonna pass it on to Dan again, but, in, uh, but uh, we first have a, a small question for you. Um, as we want to gauge how, how often, do, like, do you use supplemental feeding in your colonies? And if, if you do, which type? And you can select more than one answer, so it's a multiple choice. So if you select syrup and protein and essential oil, you can do that. All right, we'll give it about 20 more seconds. Okay, I'm going to close the poll. I'm going to share the results. It looks like 81 people participated and syrup won at 93%, protein at 52%, other at 28%, and none at 7%. Thank you. Okay, so now Natalie's done such a nice job of laying out um, why pollen is important, its, its role in um, you know, individual bee health, colony health. Um, she's going to talk a little bit about it in the environment, how, how bees collect it. They have this uh, specialized kind of anatomy on their hind leg um, called a corbicula. Most beekeepers just call it a pollen basket. Um, but you can see in all these photos here, these bees are, are laden with um, pollen on their hind leg. They, they also have um, kind of a, a other anatomical structures like a, it's called a pollen rake that actually they can, they can kind of groom off their body hairs and it helps them pack it into this, um, these little pellets on their hind legs so they can have some degree of aerodynamics when they're returning to the hive. But most of the pollen um, that you do see a lot of it's in this, as you can see in these photos, in kind of the spectrum of yellow, orange, cream color, kind of earthy tones. Um, this one on the bottom, middle on crimson clover, that's a really dark brown. Um, but most of it is, is in the kind of yellow, orange, white spectrum. But occasionally, um, some plants do yield some really interesting pollens. And I've seen this in trapping. I've seen this in my own bees. Um, this, this picture here is from a couple months ago. I'm in Michigan um, and we have a plant here called Siberian Squill. And it has, this is not at all doctored, it, it has this very beautiful indigo blue pollen. Um, so these really stand out, you know, when you're, when you're watching bees and you're seeing a lot of yellow and orange come in and then you see something like this bright blue, it really, really gets your attention. Um, so that's, um, you know, just by kind of observing, you get a lot of questions about pollen identification. Um, my personal favorite way to do it is to walk around the garden and kind of catch them in the act, so to speak. If I, I take a lot of photos and if, as you can see from these previous photos, if you see a bee on a flower with pollen on it, that's confirmation of what color the pollen from that flower is. They exhibit this floral fidelity where they'll, they're only going to, a honeybee will only get visit one type of flower on its foraging trip. Um, so that's one way to do it. We'll get into pollen ideas. We get into the, the study a little further. But as far as a, um, just your personal observations in your garden and, and your landing boards, you will see a lot of, a lot of pollen in the, these sort of color ranges. Um, so the bees bring it back. This is, you know, the older bees are the foragers. They're, you know, as they move through their lifespan, foraging is typically the last uh, task they perform. And the older bees bring it back to the colony and offload it near the brood nest. Now with this frame, we have a really good, um, this is kind of a textbook example of this, 
kind of concentric circles within the brood nest. We have our capped brood in the middle, um, and we'll have a little bit of open brood around the perimeter of that. And then that yellow band we see around that, that's the, that's the stored pollen in the colony. You know, it's three or four cells wide in most cases. And then out beyond that, we have nectar and a little bit of capped honey in the corners. Um, but it is stored, this band of pollen, as you'll see it, how it kind of encircles the brood nest. Um, it's put right there for proximity because as Natalie mentioned, it is so critical to the brood rearing. So the, those nurse bees that are gonna be feeding the next generation, it, it's kind of that easy access. Um, so those young bees are digesting it and, and uh, creating the brood food to feed the, the developing larvae. Um, and actually as the, the older bees kind of progress through their life and become foragers, they, they lose the ability to, to digest the protein. So they're not even physically capable of eating it. They're just gonna be consuming that um, nectar or honey, just the, the carbohydrates, essentially just burning calories for fuel to fly. Um, but yeah, that, that's a really good sign when you see this nice band right around the brood nest. That's a good indication in the colony. Um, as far as, um, we have another slide here that just a little close up on kind of, this is, you know, stored pollen in the comb. Again, we, we're seeing, you know, three, four, five different colors here, pretty well represented. That's a great indication. Um, when those foragers do come home, they'll offload into empty cells near the brood nest. And it's, it's actually kind of the middle-aged bees that process that raw incoming pollen um, into stored pollen or, or bee bread. They, they mix it with a little bit of honey and they have some glandular, excuse me, glandular secretions. Um, and then they pack it down densely in the cells and then they'll kind of, they'll cover it with a little film of honey. Um, and that starts the fermentation process and it becomes um, bee bread. Essentially it prolongs the, it improves the, the nutrition quality and sort of prolongs its shelf life. So as a beekeeper, I generally use, you know, stored pollen or um, pollen in the comb interchangeably with bee bread. But if you, if you hear beekeepers talk about bee bread, it's, it's referring to stored comb, sorry, stored pollen in the comb that kind of functions as the bee's pantry. Um, so that's what we mean when we say bee bread. And we, you know, we like to see it in and around the brood nest. Um, so this is kind of, you know, how the bees handle it, where it is in the colony. Um, as Natalie mentioned, the, the diversity is, you know, the, the quality and abundance certainly matter, but diversity is really important too. Um, these are from different projects that have been involved in trapping pollen. Um, this one on the left is, is uh, Western Oregon, Willamette Valley, where it's a very mosaic landscape, diverse agriculture, a lot of, you know, it's very lush. Um, a lot of roadside, you know, plants, weeds, things like that. And you see this real, you know, there's half a dozen different types of pollen, well represented there, well mixed, diverse sample. And this on the right is out in the uh, high desert of Eastern Oregon during a watermelon pollination event. Um, and they're getting watermelon pollen and, and nothing else. So that, you know, that's not meeting the, you know, the diversity criteria for, um, the, you know, the optimal health. Um, so, that just provided a pretty stunning visual example to me when I emptied that pollen trap um, in the watermelon. Another thing that's um, really interesting to see is, this is another um, in Western Oregon again, just to give an idea, this is the same colony, same location in kind of a teaching and demonstration yard at the university. And we were looking at um, trapping pollen there in the springtime. And it was really eye-opening to me just how over the span of about a 10-day interval, you can just see, even just at a coarse look, the color composition of these changes. You say, same location. So that's giving you an idea that what is blooming in the landscape dictates what the colonies are getting into, and that can progress pretty rapidly through the season. Um, so that this just provided a nice example of that temporal change in what's available in the environment. Now, the next aspect was, and this kind of plays in with when we talk about designing um, these studies and wanting to trap pollen either as a, you know, whatever we want to do with it, whether it's looking at environmental parameters or colony health metrics. Um, this was a project and these two drawers on these pollen traps came off hives that were right next to each other, sitting side by side on a pallet. And you can just see, um, 
you know, one colony is kind of locked on to a particular food source, a lot of this dark brown, probably crimson clover stuff. And that is almost entirely absent in the, the, the sample on the right. Even though these colonies have completely access to the same forage, um, you know, they, they just key on to different things. Also the abundance um, that those colonies get, and that could be a high health uh, factor. It could have to do with population size. It could have to do with the amount of brood that's being reared in those colonies. But when we do look at this, and um, this, this photo kind of highlights the importance of not just trapping from like one colony in a location, because we may get very different interpretations of what's happening if we emptied one of these traps versus the other. So we typically do a, a pooled sample or a trap from four or six colonies in a yard to kind of get a more more representative sample and then we'll mix that together just to get coverage on the landscape if we remember that our our colonies are covering a you know several mile radius um, so we, we want to get kind of a broad sample if we're trying to make some landscape level um, conclusions so that's you know those are some things on um, a little bits we've learned from looking at pollen trapped pollen um, just on the mechanics of the actual trapping also had a, a, uh, a fair amount of experience there and learning curve and we'll just briefly share a couple things it's not um, something maybe a lot of you haven't had experience with but some of the things we, we do learn um, there are different types of traps either uh, on the left here there's kind of these um, front mount traps or on the right there's a kind of an undermount in the drawer um, so there's different styles depending on um, what you want I'll, I'll mention briefly the pros and cons here in a minute but just gives you an idea of, of some of the different pollen traps that are out there they're all they're all available through your your standard you know bee supply companies where you're going to buy frames boxes etc um, most of them sell pollen traps of several different styles as well um, with um, so we have here on the, the two photos on the left those are what we call um, like a front mount trap or a front porch trap um, they kind of bolt on to their screw on or staple on to the front of the hives um, they're very easy to install and remove um, you don't have to deconstruct the hive whereas on the right we have what's like an undermount trap that white box that just looks like another brood box is actually a pollen trap same dimensions they do come with an eight frame and ten frame um, on that last photo we saw the drawer open so on the left side of that you can see the drawers just pushed in um, but this fully mounts under the colony um, these are preferable in my opinion if you're going to have your trap on for an extended period for a portion of the season um, there's just less less hassle when you get it on once and take it off once but given a lot of the work we do in trapping pollen is for a kind of a short duration a 24-hour sample or something putting them on the front um, it works best for our um, our purposes and, and avoids deconstructing the hive putting it underneath and then going back and reversing that process 24 hours later. So we tend to use these, um, you know, front porch style for the short term. Um, one kind of negative aspect of that is you don't get weather protection when, when it's hanging out the front, it is kind of vulnerable to getting rained on, splashed on, um, you know, rain on the ground will splash back up into your pollen that's being stored in the basket. So that's, that's a little bit of a, um, you know, when we're looking at these pollen trapping studies, we're, we're paying very close attention to the, the forecast. One, so the bees will be able to get out and forage, but also so what sample they are, we are able to get is not spoiled by getting too wet. So that would be an argument for the undermount versus the front porch. Um, if, again, if it's something you're looking at setting up. Also a little, um, you know, once the bees get oriented to that undermount, um, it's, it's uh, a more normal look, you know, they use visual cues to get their, their themselves home. And so, having this kind of big apparatus strapped to the front of their colony that's a different color is, is you know, throws them off. Um, it, it's a little disorienting. They, they do figure it out fairly quickly, but that's something with the undermount style that's a benefit there too. Um, so those are the two main um, different types of pollen traps. We have um, just little things we've learned in installing them. Um, on the left there, a little piece of foam tucked in. A lot of beekeepers for ventilation purposes either have like a, an upper entrance, either in a uh, inner cover or a lid, uh, or they'll have auger holes in the boxes to help you know, relieve traffic and ventilate. Um, 
if you're wanting to get a maximum pollen sample, you, you want to seal those entrances so the bees essentially have to go through the pollen trap. Um, it's much easier to do that with, with fairly new equipment that's got good square corners. Anytime you get into kind of rotten boxes or soft corners, that's a lot of potential places the bees can come and go from that you've got to block off. Um, one thing to be aware of if you're trapping pollen in uh, high heat or humidity is it's better to seal those actually with a, like a hardware cloth than it is a foam. So it will it won't allow traffic, but it will allow ventilation uh, because we don't want we don't want to stress them out by impeding airflow in the colony in particularly hot conditions. Um, making things be tight, table work in small places, but also being mindful that when it's particularly hot, uh, a lot of the tape adhesive will tend to let go in the heat. We've and I, I say these things from experience, so hopefully if if any of you are um, going to try pollen trapping using you know some of these things that we we've, we've learned don't work. Um, we can hopefully, hopefully, you know, accelerate your, your success by um, adhering to some of these things. One other um, aspect is if you are going to be trapping pollen on your colonies, you don't want to take too much, um, you know, as we, we, you know, just learned how important it is, the critical role it plays in, in bee and, and colony health. So you don't want to permanently have a pollen trap on and kind of deprive them of that pollen. Um, both of these front porch style traps have on the left here, you can see that the, uh, the lattice that they have to pass through is, is flipped up in that top photo. So that's just free flow and free access, um, not collecting any pollen at all. And then at the bottom it's engaged and we'll have to go through that screen and it will strip the pollen. Same idea in the photo on the right, it just has a removable screen that will open it up without stripping the pollen. Um, so it's nice that these traps are designed to either be installed but can be disengaged. Um, so typically when we do it, we collect for 24 or 48 hours and then you know, we either remove the traps or they're left open for an extended period before we want to sample again. This is very uh, location dependent. You know, some places, um, particularly areas in Michigan where I am, uh, there is no shortage of pollen to the point where it actually can start to choke up hives at certain times of year. Um, but it's something you want to be aware of, not to take too much to the point where your colony is not actually um, getting what they need. Another thing we learned early on in some of these pollen traffic studies. Um, when we could, it was good to put these traps on beforehand um, and leave them, leave the gates open and allow the bees to orient before we came back to uh, actually close the gate and start collecting pollen. Just for an orientation, you end up, you see the photo on the left, a lot of bees on the, on the hive. Um, they, they do get a bit disoriented. They, say they figured out the matter of hours, but it's helpful to let them orient first. Um, and we did really find, uh, let's say, working with commercial beekeepers, I almost exclusively deal with hives that are on pallets, either in four or six. And we found it really important to trap um, from colonies on the same side of a pallet with their entrances oriented the same direction. If you just put a trap on one of those and not the other, it will just cause all the bees uh, to drip next door um, to that colony. So not good for the beekeeper and not getting us a sample. So that was something we also we learned was to kind of make it uniform on one side. Maybe not applicable to smaller scale, but just something to keep in mind as, as how the bees are viewing this device that you're gonna put on their colony. So I think with that, did we have, okay, Natalie's gonna get into the kind of overview of the project now that we've laid out the background. Oh, thank you for that. So, so yes, as, as we said, uh, this, this, um, we wanted to share some of the results from a pilot study that we conducted last year. Um, so the objective was really to try to assess the nutritional um, level uh, during certain pollination or honey production events. We wanted to, uh, to see if during those critical periods uh, or environment, uh, we could actually apprise kind of the potential um, for those uh, for diagnostics to to give us some information about the pollen quality, quantity, diversity uh, that was available to the bees, and 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 maybe give the beekeeper some insights onto the nutritional status of their bees in those locations, and see if they you know uh, uh, if, they, if that could lead to some some change in management decision. Um, so how we did this, and we worked with two beekeepers in in two states, one in Georgia, one in Maryland. And in Georgia, the beekeeper was actually doing 
um, uh, placing their, colon their colonies in cotton um, because that's, that is a good honey crop for them. So they like to put their colony there to, to get um, um, uh, cotton honey in particular. And then in Maryland, uh, the, the beekeeper we worked with just had colonies next to us uh, in, in a lot of uh, semi-agricultural uh, setting, a lot of soybeans around them. So we thought those are two very different environments. We can try our pilot studies, uh, test. Uh, we, we found a laboratory to work with uh, that was conducting some of the analysis for us. Uh, just to tell you, we had to find that laboratory in Europe. <laughs> So, um, uh, so it was a good test of the relationship with the laboratory as well, and, and just trying to understand uh, the data that we could get from those analyses and if we could make them meaningful for the beekeeper and provide info information to the beekeeper and, and some interesting insights. Um, so the way we did again, um, um, in each of the, in each, for each of the beekeeper, colonies were placed into three different yards, and in each yard, four colonies uh, were trapped, um, with, uh, were placed with pollen traps, and the pollen collected from those four colonies was pooled, um, um, and that corresponded to our sampling, uh, to our sample. We did that uh, at, at three different time period, which we called pre-bloom, peak bloom, and post-bloom. Uh, that actually refers to the target crop, which was either cotton or soybeans, knowing that um, uh, it's, it's not that we were expecting the majority of the pollen to come from those stores, but just to give us some indication um, uh, over time. And you can see on the right what that ended up being in terms of collection date. It was June, July, and August or September uh, of 2019. So when the pollen was collected, we sent it to the lab uh, for analysis, and we got information in protein content, amino acid composition, as well as some identification of the plants. Um, and I'm going to tell you in a minute how, how they did that. They basically looked at microscopy, and I'm going to show you how, how they did it. Um, so now, uh, just a, a side note, because we had the question, yes, pollen can also tell us about the contamination in the landscape in terms of pesticides and heavy metals. Uh, in this webinar, we're actually focusing on nutrition, um, but if, if there is demand, and it seems like there is, we're probably going to do a, a webinar on pesticides in particular, we just don't have a date yet. All right, so first is pollen quantity, and this is something that actually kind of took us by surprise, so we didn't actually formally record it. Um, but we got a sense that um, um, of the pollen quantity that the, the bees were, were gathering during those trials. So basically in Maryland, we were able to do 12 ore traps and got plenty of pollen so that we had enough to do to send the, for analysis all three events, all colonies collected sufficiently pass, uh, and, uh, pollen so that there was no issues in, in getting the minimum amount that was required for the analysis. Now in Georgia, uh, Dan wasn't so lucky. Uh, we actually had to move from 12 to 24 hours and stay, stay longer than he had planned in his, in his sampling trip to come back the next day to collect more pollen because the, 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 in, in two of the three events, it's really the colony struggled to get even the quantity of pollen needed for the, the minimum amount needed for analysis. So uh, if we had to redo the experiment, we would formally col um, get, uh, like collect the information on, on, the, on the, quant like the, the weight of the pollen gathered. But we got some ideas already that Georgia seemed to be um, um, a tougher place in terms of pollen than Maryland, at least during those three sampling events and during the, at these specific locations. Um, um, so that was one indication where we were expecting that results in Maryland would be better, maybe. Well, and this is where um, uh, we were saying that um, pollen quantity is only one of the aspects uh, that we need. Right? So we, the second thing that we needed to look at was the, the protein content of that pollen. As we said, different, not, not all pollens are equal. About 20% of protein content is what is required for colonies for ideal uh, condition for brood rearing. So I have noted this 20 line as this orange uh, dashed line uh, horizontally. So that is basically the mark, the threshold that we're trying to get above which colonies uh, are supplemented, are uh, provided with good enough protein content to ensure uh, optimal brood rearing. And, and that's where the first time we, we um, that the, the first disappointment we had, because in Georgia, out of the nine sampling events, so three yards for three, uh, for three timing events, uh, only one of them uh, reached that threshold. All of the other uh, yards in, different, in the different uh, periods did not meet that requirement. Um, so we were, we were um, 
hovering between 15 and 20, but only only once a yard in one time in one period actually uh, broke that ceiling. In Maryland, um, um, the, the 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 first sampling round was um, uh, also deficient in in crude protein content. Uh, the second sampling round. All of the three yards um, um, had pollen that actually met the mark. And then again, on the third sampling round, uh, the quality of the protein content uh, decreased again. So though the quantity of pollen in Maryland um, was, you know, was, was definitely not an issue, in terms of quantity, it seems like the bees still didn't get much of the protein content that they needed in most of the time. The second aspect that we, the, the result that we looked at is the amino acid composition. So we said in the introduction that there is 10 essential amino acids that bees cannot synthesize on their own, that they have to get from pollen. And so this is the list of the 10 amino acids that are essential to bees. And on the, on, um, as lines in this table, you have the two states and the three sampling periods for each of the states. And basically, if the cell is uh, green, it means that there was enough of that specific amino acids in that sample to, um, um, uh, to ensure um, the nutritional needs of the bees. And if it's marked as a D, it means that it was deficient for that particular amino acid. And we're using um, a, an old study because this is things that have been, this, uh, that have been um, um, uh, investigated a long time ago. A lot of the nutritional information that we have is actually from the 60s, 50s and 60s. Um, as we said, it's an understudied area, but it's not new, right? So we, we, we do have some, some very good studies out there. Some of them are really old. Uh, I, as we said, um, more, more research is needed, but it is not something that, um, that not all of it is recent. So as you can see here, um, um, in all of, um, um, so all of the, uh, of, of, sorry, of the 10 pollen amino acid essential for honeybees nutritional needs, uh, the pollen collected during this study showed deficiencies um, in all but one, right? Istidine was the only one that was uh, not deficient in any sample. All the other were deficient at one point or another during this study. And the most deficient were isoleucine, methionine, and valine um, that were most of the time missing from the sample. And we can also see that there was some temporal variation. Uh, in Georgia, in particular, the, 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 com the composition of amino acids started really poor with only you know, nine out of the 10 amino acids that was missing. And then uh, as we were moving through time for peak boom to post boom, the, 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 the third sampling round was really the only single time where um, um, we found all 10 essential amino acids in quantities that were enough to ensure uh, the nutritional needs of colonies. And, and so that was apparently, uh, though, you know, we said, you, as we said earlier, we struggled in terms of quantity of pollen, um, in terms of composition, at least that pollen was of very high quality. And in Maryland, it, we kind of observed a similar trend in that the first and the second sampling round were of very low quality. Uh, uh, eight and nine out of the 10 amino acids uh, were deficient. And then the third sampling round was the best of the three uh, with most essential amino acids um, needs that were met. Um, so again, Maryland, though we had plenty of quantity of pollen, uh, the, the quality seemed and the amino acid composition seemed to be somehow lacking most of the time. So the last result um, that we're gonna show you is uh, concerning diversity. So here I'm showing you, uh, on the left is a picture that I took from the Australian Pollen and Core Atlas. It's just showing you um, what pollen can look like under the microscope. And, um, and basically some people can use morphological um, uh, aspects of the, of the pollen to identify the plant type uh, by morphology. So looking under the microscope at a subsample of the, of the pollen collected by the bees, um, can be enough to identify the pollen type. Now, this is a very tricky, tri this is a very tricky um, 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 uh, topic in that like people need to be really specialized, and also it seems to be very dependent on the location. 
So usually experts that can do that, they can do it for their own region, but it doesn't mean they can identify all pollen from everywhere in the world or even everywhere in the country. They usually are very specialized on a specific location um, uh, because, because pollen is just so variable. So the, um, in this particular study, we found uh, 44 plant types for 21 families in Georgia. And so that's the total richness, that is, that is the total number of different plant source that we found um, in, in all of the samples. So that is represented by that horizontal line, dash line um, um, for Georgia at 44. And, and you can see how in Maryland, all together, all samples combined, we only found 27 plant types in comparison. So the diversity, the richness, the number of um, plant type found in Maryland was lower than in Georgia. Also from, uh, from sampling to sampling, um, from event to event, we saw that uh, in Georgia, the richness didn't really change much, uh, 24, 27, and 23, which means that um, though the species themselves, you know, uh, changed from one sample to the next, uh, the, the richness, the number of plants found was relatively uh, consistent. In Maryland, however, the richness really peaked at the third sampling round. Uh, which, if you remember, is also the in, in the amino acids composition. This is the sampling round that was the less, the less deficient. So there seems to be some a relationship between diversity and, and, and composition of amino acids, right? The fact that we got more plant types into that sample might have meant that we got um, 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 more of the different amino acids that were needed. Though in Georgia, the, the, the third sampling one was also the one with the least deficiencies. It had no deficiencies. It was, it was perfect for all amino acids. And you can see that um, you know, it was not different in richness than the other two, which were deficient. So that is some indication that, yes, diversity is important, but it's not a synonym of, of quality nether. So again, all of those aspects are important to understand uh, nutritional quality of, of, of the environment and the, the the, the pollen. All right, this is another representation of those identification that we were telling you about. Uh, this is to show you, um, this is a graph where you can see Georgia on the left, Maryland on the right, and each of the bar represents a, a sampling round. On the top, you have the first sampling round, second sampling round, and third sampling round at the bottom. And this shows you the dominance of some species compared to other. Because when we look at uh, species diversity, it is important to know how many species you have, but also how even they are with each other, right? If you have one single species that dominates the landscape, and in this case, dominate the samples, and only a small amount of other species, it's actually not a very diverse sample. So what we want is we want high number of species, but we also want high evenness of the different species. And here we can definitely see uh, in this graph in which the area uh, of the graph represents the number of time that the, the plant was found in the samples. We can see that in Georgia, yes, we had, we had a just general more richness, more, you know, more names on the, on the graph, but also more evenness. There, there, is, there is a couple or, 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 or species that are more present than other, but it's usually uh, more even than the samples that were found in Maryland, in which one single species usually represents the majority of the pollen in the sample, uh, right? So trifolium repens is actually clover and Lagostromia is crepe myrtle. And we can see that those two plants really dominated the samples uh, during the respective periods of time. So one thing that was uh, interesting though expected is that the target cultivated crop to which, you know, next to which the colonies were located um, were found, but in very, very small amounts, which is not, was not unexpected because they have the reputation to be of little value in terms of pollen sources for bees. So um, cotton uh, for Georgia is glossipium, which I can try to show you with a laser pointer. Here is glossipium. So this is the, this is the cotton, probably. And then um, in, in Maryland, soybean is actually glycine max. So it was present here at the third sampling round, which actually we identify as post bloom, but strangely that's when we picked it up. Uh, but it, on, it was only uh, found in, in, in small quantity. Um, and uh, so 4% of the grain counted in Georgia, 10% in Maryland, so confirming their reputation as of little value, little interest to the honeybees as, as pollen sources. 
So now, if we put all the results together, um, the, the richness, diversity, uh, amino acids composition, and quantity, and protein content, it really seems like um, in Maryland, the, the abundance of crepe myrtle in the single sampling event is probably what provided with the good quantity of pollen, but of low quality. Uh, and, and in Georgia, you know, the rise in amino acid quality, which seems to be associated with that third sampling round, coincides with the appearance of the fabaceae uh, in the samples, which are actually the family of legumes, peas, and beans. So it is possible that some species in that group was responsible with the rise of quality um, uh, at, at during that sampling, that sampling period. So overall, yeah, the samples were deficient in both crude protein content and in several essential amino acids. Uh, so deficient and not, not enough to support optimal brood rearing in the honeybee colonies, and particularly so in the first two sampling rounds in both locations. So assuming that those conditions, you know, in that phase and time of year um, are representative of typical years, we basically recommended those beekeepers that they would consider um, a protein feeding to supplement the, the needs of their colonies. Um, and so, you know, we, 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 heard, not, we heard that enough, uh, but it's um, just to reiterate, you know, quantity is not quality and diversity is good, but it's not the gauge of quality either. We really need the three of them and the three of them is hard to get. So a colleague of mine usually has the, this joke that in terms of human food, you can find cheap and easy, you can find cheap and nutritious, you can find easy and nutritious, but you usually cannot find cheap, easy and nutritious. You can only get two out of the three. It seems to be the case for pollen as well. Um, so I wanted to finish with, uh, with Dan. Can you, can you give us like um, some, you know, object like what, what the beekeeper that got the results um, found from those results? Yeah. So, so in, in say, I, I did the, the pollen collection down in Georgia and spent a, a fair amount of time talking to this beekeeper both during and, and then once we had some results in hand. And he, it, it was, um, you know, in talking with him, he said, you know, we, we put the bees in cotton to make honey. Um, and we've been doing this for decades. And most years, they they just kind of hold their own or they go backwards. The brood, the, the brood quality and quantity um, decreases, you know, the pattern might get a little spotty and, and the brood nest kind of shuts down, even though this is still fairly, we're in, you know, into like now June into July um, and the colonies are going forward and making honey. Um, they're also kind of, um, you know, deteriorating too at the same time. And this was, you know, he said in the past, we haven't known, is it a, is it nutrition? Is it a, is it Varroa? We think we do okay with that. Is it something in the environment? Is it a stressor? Is it a pesticide? So really, in, you know, unknown, we just see this pattern of we put our bees here, they make honey, but they don't do great. But having this kind of information to say, oh, maybe we have a nutritional bottleneck here. And that, you know, I say we, we know, um, you know, poor nutrition leads to diminished brood rearing. Um, so it kind of fit in with the, this information supported the beekeepers observation over over decades. And so this year, this beekeeper um, prior to and during the early bloom stage was going to start feeding supplemental protein to his colonies. Um, you know, and I'll, I'll be talking, we're not planning on any sampling this year, but just that it'll be interesting to see just as a a visual observation if that um, helps their, you know, colony health while they're sitting in cotton. As we know with the nutrition, it is such a, you know, just there's so many unknowns to it. And we know that the supplemental feeding is not as good as the real thing. It's not a cure-all, but it, if, if it can kind of be a, a bridge, as we saw that last sampling event at the end of August or first of September down there, uh, the nutrition from the environment was very good. So it may be this, you know, June into July, August stage that if you can kind of help them through that period, um, they, they may get onto that fall in a better state. And we know that just for overall colony health, uh, those last few generations of the fall, the setting up the winter beets is really critical. So we're hopeful to say, even though this was just a, you know, a starting point, um, a, li a little bit of an investigation that it, it, it did seem to yield something that, you know, kind of lined up with direct beekeeper observation in the field and they were able to 
implement a change and we'll we'll see if that um, you know makes a difference going forward yeah absolutely yeah i wanted to finish by by, by reiterating this the what you basically just said that nutrition is an understudied area i know we deserve more attention but the reason why it's understudied is really because of challenges um just you know there's not a lot of labs out there that actually do those analyses um and um we had to use a lab in europe um to do this there are some labs in the u.s that that do uh, honeybee uh, nutrition research but most of them as i said they, they're focused on research they're not performing monitoring services they're not set up high capacity um and in particular the identification of the pollen types that microscopy that i was showing you is really a rare gift uh, it is more of an art than anything else. It's um, uh, it's um, it's a knowledge that is unfortunately under peril because a couple of people that can do it, um, um, you know, there's only a couple of them. Uh, so you count them on on the on the fingers, and it's um, it would be a shame uh, if no more people are trained to be able to do this. Um, so. So yeah, as I said, also it depends on location. So they usually are able to identify, you know, pollen in their area, but not pollen from another another places. So those are those are like what makes those studies difficult. But um, in future direction, what has been identified as gaps to be filled um, uh, by research is trying to identify those bottlenecks, like Dan was saying. Right, uh, we can try to uh, assess the quality of the landscape. Um, um, to, and to identify when are the zones and the times at risk, so to really allow beekeepers to know when to intervene, know when to add supplementation at the right time, even though, as Dan said, it's more a band-aid than a long-term solution. Um, so, so yeah, uh, I guess we wanted to just finish by asking Gajing your interest as to uh, would you be interested in this type of service? Uh, we are not currently set up to perform those analyses. Um, we had this trial practice with the um, uh, for this for this pilot study, uh, and so we were interested to know if that would be of interest to to, to the beekeepers around it. Great, we'll give it another fifteen seconds here. Okay, I'm going to end the polling with about 60 people participating. Um, it looks like 40% are definitely interested, 28% likely, 17% neutral, and 15% not likely. Zero at not at all. Good to know. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end here by uh, thanking our sponsors and collaborators. This pilot in particular was actually funded by the James Cox Foundation, um, but we do have all other partners that are uh, supporting our program. And if, if, if you want to support our program, we are a nonprofit that are taking donations as well. And we are also going to start the, um, the question and answer uh, at this point. Great, thank you both. That was really excellent. We're very excited to learn all of this. And my name is Net Meredith. I don't think I introduced myself at the beginning. I'm the executive director of BIP and I'll be uh, doing our Q&A today. We have a lot of questions. So we're gonna try to get as many in in the next 20 minutes. Please stick around if you can. Lots of good questions coming in. Um, please make your answer short presenters so that we could get as many of these answered. We did get a few preemptive questions that came in over email before the webinar. So I've included those in here as well. So let me go ahead and get it started with the first one. This was from earlier in the presentation. James asks, would you consider adding a small amount of Epsom salt magnesium chloride to syrup as, a poten as potentially beneficial? For example, a tablespoon for three gallons. Not something I'm aware of um, as a feed additive. Um, yeah, I I don't have a good answer. I'm not sure. Okay, the next one uh, from Cheryl. Do adult bees eat pollen? Yeah. So the uh, the young, what we call, tend to call nurse bees, eat the pollen so that they can create 
the brood food to feed the next generation of the developing larvae, but not all adult, not all adult bees do as the bees become older, they lose their ability to digest this. The foragers are just gonna be onto the carbohydrate diet, but young adult bees do, yes. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, from Mike, in an attempt to better understand what my girls are bringing in, I downloaded a pollen app on my phone, but I find it's lacking, for my purposes anyway. It shows a couple types of pollen in the air, but I know the bees are bringing in many more types than what the app shows. Do you know of a better source for tracking what plants are blooming in one's locality? I've not found a good source for, my, for predicting nectar and pollen flows in my area of Colorado. It's... It's such a local specific thing. I would, I would almost maybe reach out to other beekeepers, bee clubs. You know, if, if you've got veteran beekeepers that have decades of experience, they're going to know this comes on in April, then we get this followed by that. Um, I think I would try to start there. There are some things online, some of the bee supply companies. Um, there are some posters out there. Again, they're not going to be local specific. Um, but there are kind of some color charts for the major pollen sources, and, and you may have some of those near you. So there are resources available if you just search like um, pollen color ID guide or something like that. But I, I think firsthand knowledge from experienced locals would probably be your best bet. Great. Okay, I am going to combine two questions from Stephen and John because they're quasi related. Are floral pollens becoming less nutritional as climate change slash global warming affect growing times and geographical ranges of flowers that bees utilize for protein sources? And will you be speaking to the impact of increased atmospheric CO2 concentration over time on pollen quality? So I know that there has been uh, some research about the impact of climate change and in particular, um, yeah, CO2 increase, temperature increase, the fact that the phenology of the plants might vary. Um, so honeybees have the advantage of being active for a very long amount of time, right? The season that the bees are active is, is very large compared to native bees. So, so they're less affected by, uh, like if a, if, a couple of spe if a species of plant is, is late for a couple of weeks, uh, it is um, it is getting it's going to be harder for the beekeeper, I guess, to to um, um, to plan right. You want your colonies to be strong to be able to take advantage of the of the bloom. So yeah, there are some phenology issues um, um, in terms uh, of quantity uh, quality of pollen. I don't know um, uh, from the top of my head. Um, I'm but I believe there might have been studies, but uh, I would have to look it up. All right, thank you. Um, Nicole and Paula were wondering about um, how collecting the pollen impacts the health of the bees, and you've already answered that, you, you don't want to keep the trap engaged for too long. Um, I'll move on to the next one from Cod. Could the precipitation within bloom stages affect the protein quality of the pollen? Can you repeat that? Sorry. Sure. The precipitation within bloom stages affect the protein quality of the pollen? It's a good question. We actually, when we were talking this morning, it came up and I, I don't think we arrived at an answer. I mean, we kind of arrived at, we certainly know it impacts nectar availability, but as far as pollen availability, I'm not sure, but it, it is an interesting question. I don't have an answer to it. Okay, uh, next one from James. In the slides talking about peak bloom, what is the method you use to determine that? And was it based solely upon peak bloom of target honey crop, uh, Georgia cotton, Maryland soy? So that was a, a shorthand that we used. We basically wanted to have three sampling periods and we thought that the best way to have um, a, a good you know, metric uh, in that location was to look at the target crop, which as I said was cotton and, and soybean, which we know was, we're not gonna be major source of pollen, but that was kind of like our, our indicator of landscape change in, in the environment. It ended up being about one sample per month. Uh, as, we, as we showed the dates, we basically sampled in, in June, July, and then August or, September, or early September. Um, so yeah, it was just an indication for us as to, we are now is a good time to take another sample. Uh, and we did that um, visually looking at um, uh, the flowers we could see in, uh, uh, in, in, that, in those locations. Great. Uh, next one from Lisa. It would have been interesting to see an urban pollen study. Will that be the next one? 
<laughs> that would be definitely interesting. So yeah, next pilot study that we get funding for. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Okay, um, from Ray, what is the best method to feed pollen substitute um, dry patties inside hive or outside hive? Um, I generally prefer patties inside hive. Um, just generally speaking, whether protein or carb, I'm not a real uh, proponent of outside of the hive feeding. It can incite robbing, disease transmission. It's also an aspect of, you know, big hives get more, little hives don't get enough. So those that need it the most get it the least kind of thing. Um, so, so I like patties and hives um, just on top bars. One potential pitfall with feeding uh, protein, uh, particularly if you're in an area where small hive beetles are bad, almost like in Georgia in the southeast, they can, where it's real warm and humid, they can be. Um, you don't want to feed much more than your your colony will kind of consume in a week, ten days time. You, so it may be better to feed, you know, half of a patty twice rather than a full patty that would take them three weeks to eat. So kind of smaller amounts more frequently might be better. All right, you had you predicted the next question from Lily. Can you tell us if there is a drawback to giving the bees too much pollen patty, assuming the ants, et cetera, are manageable? So you just answered that one. Um, the next one from Susan. Have you tried DNA barcoding of the pollen? So we have not, but you're right, this is another identification tool. Um, so yeah, no, we haven't. Okay. Um, another one, let's see. If I was to trap and sell, should it be tested for contaminants? Is it unethical to sell untested? Uh, I'm, I'm not going to get into the ethics, but uh, I would want to know what I was selling. Um, we do we have done a lot of pollen analysis for pesticides and um, bearing in mind your bees cover a several mile radius. Um, it's not just what's on your you know, piece of land or the land that your bees are on. Uh, you have very little control about what they're actually going to get into. So I, I would want to know. Okay. Um, from Nicole, as a Maryland beekeeper, would you recommend feeding protein for specific amino acids or a coverall? Um, so yeah, that's a good question in this case uh, the study that we did in maryland not that not that you know that area is representative of all maryland of course um, um we found that uh, the, the the pollen gathered was deficient in in several amino acids except i think histidine was the only one that was um, uh, found in all samples so it's 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 hard to say that's also part of the unknown uh, we do not have a lot of studies that look at amino acids content uh, in the landscape and so it's probably, you know, it, it's very hard to judge what is missing in which location. Uh, so that's part of what our, you know, our future studies is. We want to determine those, um, those, those nutritional needs in the landscape uh, to see what is there and what is missing. So it's hard to, to, to know <laughs> before we've done uh, the study. But um, I, I don't be, like I don't believe that you have the nutrition like you know the amino acid content of the food nutrients never right so or oh, maybe I'm, I'm 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 wrong on that aspect but it's like you, when you buy a commercially available protein supplements um, I don't think you act, we actually know their composition in amino acid never so that is another aspect of um, uh, that needs to be studied more. Great. Uh, David sent a really cool picture of uh, passion flower pollen under the scope in. Um, I'm in Maryland. Is there a pollen expert in our state that would be available as a resource? I enjoy pollen sampling and the identification challenge, but have many questions. I don't know of anyone in Maryland. Yeah, they're, they're, those experts, you know, as I said, they're very rare. I know of two in the U.S. and they're not close to here. <laughs> Where do you, could you mention where they are for folks on the line? Uh, I'm so, like, I'm terrible with names. So. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, okay, we have another one from Janice. If you want to plant wildflowers, is there a formula for the amount of area you need per 10 frame hive? Uh, 
I, I don't know any, um, you know, quick rule of thumb, obviously more, more is better. Um, you know, j just in the practical, what I see on the landscape and again, bearing in mind, I, I work with, um, you know, the large beekeepers, they'll typically run anywhere between 30 and 60 in a yard and then try to space yards at a, a couple miles distance. So they feel that's a reasonable carrying capacity. But as, as far as, you know, how much food to support one hive, I mean, you, you're, the, the forage radius is so large and, you know, over the course of the year, I, I think it would just be important to look at diversity and look at bloom throughout the year. So things starting, you know, depending on where you are, maybe in April and carrying on late into the year, just kind of having succession of plants but I, I don't know what a you know I can't give you a acres per colony number. Great um, it looks like we've answered all of the questions I'll give it one more minute to see if any last minute questions come in actually more like 10 seconds let's see if there's one last question here. All right I think we've answered them all. Thank you both for this great presentation. Um, thank you to our audience. I know you're applauding loudly. We can't hear you, but we expect you are. Um, stay tuned for, or not stay tuned, but tune in for our next one, which will be in a couple weeks. We will post it soon on our website at beinformed.org slash education. And um, we also recorded this today and we will post this recording to that same site within a day or two. So thank you for joining us and we hope to see you at our next one. Please stay healthy. Bye-bye.